We are ready.
everybody, it's Mark from City Church. You know, I woke up got, this morning, got dressed, and I noticed my shirt is kind of tight. And, you know, I thought it must be the dryer that's to blame, but it turns out it's the refrigerator. <laughs> Good morning, City Church. Good morning, Good morning City, City Church. Church. Good morning, City 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 Church. Hello, City Church. Good morning, City Church. Good morning, City Church. Good morning, City Church. One, two. Good morning, City Church. Good morning, City Church. Good morning, City Church. We are so glad that you are with us today. Well, it looks as though spring is truly here, finally. I look forward to getting outside myself as soon as possible with no mask on now that we don't have to do that. This week has been a huge lift to my spirits with all the sunshine that we've gotten, and I hope that it's been a lift to your spirits too. Renata's going to talk to us in a few minutes. She didn't want to say anything, but this is likely her last sermon for City Church before we leave to Canada. I just thought you might like to know that. The end of our time is coming much too quickly in some ways, much too slowly in other ways. Uh, but next week, I'll start a two-part series to end out the month of May and to finish out our time at City Church. Last Sunday, if you weren't on the live Zoom, you missed meeting my friend Scott, who is going to lead City Church over the next several months while we continue the hiring process of the next pastor of City Church, which is also moving along quickly. And we hope to have news for you very, very soon on that. Over the next couple of weeks, you'll actually have a chance to see more of my friend Scott in the videos you'll just need to tune in. Well, whether you've given during this week already or not, we want to give you a moment to give prayerfully and intentionally, and we thank you for your generous and faithful giving. Hey, our next pub night will be Tuesday, May 25th at 7.30 p.m. Just write me at info at citychurchwarsaw.org, and I will send you the link. If you have any other questions for me or want to get in touch with us for any reason, you can write us at info at citychurchwarsaw.org as well. Uh, and that's about it that I have for today. Any questions? Great. Now, back to some music.
grew up in a dysfunctional context. My mom's main response to the challenges of life was anger. Unfortunately, parenting was one of these areas where she had no idea what she was doing. And that resulted in a lot of angry responses, often involving physical and emotional abuse. But as a lot of people with trauma, I suppressed a lot of my memories. Unconsciously, I refused to deal with any of my problems. I never reached out to anyone. I actually didn't think I had a problem. I developed a false sense of who I was and I faked confidence until my first child was born. The strong emotional experience of giving birth unlocked some of my memories and it horrified me. Fast forward a few years later, when I already had three beautiful kids, I noticed that I behaved like my mom. I started repeating her MO in parenting. I accessed anger in split second. I never laid a hand on my kids, but verbally, I was a storm. I ran over them like a tank, leaving no one standing. It wasn't pretty. I knew something had to change, but for many years, I was stuck. Book after book on self-help. Tool after tool, man, I became an expert, but still nothing was changing. Why? Well, my narrative was spinning in a wrong direction. I made excuses. I spent hours feeling sorry for myself and blaming everyone for my story. After all, nothing was my fault. I was a victim of my circumstances. Or was there something I could do? We're in a series called The Counselor. It's a three-part series based on some questions Jesus asked when he did his ministry on earth. A fun fact, Jesus actually asked more questions than he answered. In the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, Jesus asked 307 questions. People asked him 183 questions and he directly answered only three. In week one of the series, we looked at, why are you afraid? In week two, the question we unpacked was, why do you doubt? And Tim addressed what doubt really is all about. Today, we will look at one of my favorite questions asked by Jesus. To explore this question, we will look at the story recorded by John in chapter five of his gospel. Let's dive in. Some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the, the lame, the paralyzed. Let's stop here for a second. Public baths were pretty standard in Greco-Roman cities, and many people would congregate there. These pools were quite large. Imagine American football field and roughly six meters deep. The site John is describing had two twin poles surrounded by four porches and a fifth porch that was down in the middle, separating the poles. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, but later the archeologists have discovered a pool in this location fitting precisely John's description. The Jewish community in Jesus' day may have viewed this pool as a place of healing, but most healing places like that were used as pagan healing shrines. Some commentaries suggest that temple authorities most likely didn't approve of this place because of the connection to Greek cults. And we meet Jesus here, at this place. Jesus knows us so well that he does meet us at the place where we really are. Well, let's continue. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, and here it is, do you want to get well? One, I have recently noticed it. There is a multitude of sick people lying around and Jesus notices one. He comes up to one. He always had time for one. 
He knows that one changed life can have a ripple effect in communities, in the cities we live in, and ultimately in the world. This man has been sick for 38 years. Nearly four decades he spent lying around the pool waiting for healing. Here John does what most ancient reports of healing did. He specified how long the person was sick to emphasize the greatness of the healing. Obviously, for 38 years, nothing succeeded in restoring this man. Being surrounded by others who were sick in different ways probably didn't help either. We tend to find in our lives groups that affirm our condition, our issues. We like to surround ourselves with people who don't challenge us to change. There is a reason we have a saying, misery loves company. We gravitate towards people with similar issues because then we don't have to address our own state. Jesus sees the guy and asks him a question. Do you want to get well? To some of us, this question might seem kind of cruel, maybe a even a little compassionless. Doesn't Jesus see this man's condition? Where is his love for this man? How can he be so direct? Or we are thinking, doesn't he know if the guy wants to get well? But see, Jesus doesn't ask random questions. We ask questions often to find out information. Jesus asked questions to provoke transformation. This question, do you want to get well? Or in some translations you might find, do you want to get whole? Is a very important one. Many of us have issues that hold us hostage and freeze us in our inability to move forward. Remember the story I started with? I was lying around in my own misery of depression, bitterness, and forgiveness. For some of you, it might be the addiction or a toxic relationship that you know you need to end, or maybe the divorce that left you bruised and in shame, and you just can't seem to be getting past this. And we might even pray for Jesus to help us, to change our circumstances, to make others change so we can get better. But Jesus sees into our hearts and our attitudes and he turns our prayers around and asks us, do you want to get well? This question forces us to shift our perspective from the outside to the inside. It invites us to explore our convictions, our values, our behaviors, or habits. This question puts us in an uncomfortable place of self-reflection. It confronts our beliefs. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. How does the guy's response make you feel? Does it sound familiar? Well, I don't know about you, but I have surely used excuses and blame to deflect from the fact that I wasn't taking any steps to get better. Well, I thought I was. I talked a good game that I wanted to make changes, to move past my issue, but it was as if I was driving my life forward and constantly staring at the rear view mirror. Of course I was bound to crash. It wasn't for the lack of trying. I did try. I think I might have read most of the published self-help books or articles. I was spinning in circles of lack of self-awareness and therefore lack of understanding what God wanted for me and what God can do if I let him. I kept praying, but I was still stuck. Why? Well, because my prayers went something like this. God, if only my mom admitted to what she has done in my life, then I will be able to get past this anger. Then I could rebuild my relationship with her. Then I could be able to be whole, to be well. Then I would be able to control my anger. Truth be told, I have used my unwell condition as leverage. You know, it is always easier to live with what you know than step into the unknown. 
I remember thinking that my depression was familiar to me and therefore safe. To be well. To start the healing process would require hard work on my part. And why am I supposed to do this hard work? If it wasn't me who did the horrible things, right? Wrong. Becoming well means you're taking ownership of your life. You often need to do painful operations on your life history and allow God to do what he can do. Heal you. But it is a two-part job. You do your part, God does his. There is no healing without acknowledging the desire for healing. Every person who dealt with any addiction will tell you that first step to recovery is owning your part in the addiction. Becoming well means more responsibility on our part. When you get well, you're responsible for how you live your life. You're accountable for your decisions, your actions. You cannot blame it on your issues anymore. Jesus' question is a pulse check on this guy's readiness to be made well. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Jesus doesn't waste any more time. Dude, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And I have no idea why Jesus sounds like a Californian surfer in my head. Now, for a moment, imagine this guy. Just pause for a second. Put yourself in this guy's place. He hasn't walked in 38 years. We don't know how old he is, but we know he spent 38 years of his life on the mat. What would it take for you to get up after decades of not walking? This guy responds in obedience. He believes he's cured and risks getting up. In his head, it had to be a massive shift. Have you ever broken a leg or spent any time for any reason in a cast? I haven't, but I live with people who did. I can assure you, you don't have a lot of confidence in your muscles after any number of weeks of not moving at all. Jesus spoke healing into this guy's life, but this guy had to take the responsibility for a choice he made afterwards. He had to stand up and only in the space between Jesus's power and this guy's obedience, the miracle could have happened. Let me say it again, only between Jesus' power and our obedience, the miracle can happen. If we are comfortable on our mats, in our place of misery, God is not going to force healing on us. We are often plodding along in our lives, craving healing and change, but resisting the work we, ne we need to put into the transformation. Resisting, answering with obedience to God's call in our life. We choose to survive rather than thrive. We choose to settle in our lives versus living the full potential of what God wants to accomplish through us in our churches, in our communities, in our families, neighborhoods, you name it. If you let go of your issue, whatever keeps you on the mat and respond to God's call to get up, you will recover passion in your heart and God will restore the vision for your life in you. Secondly, Jesus told him to pick up his mat, not to forget it, not to deny it ever happened, not to toss it to trash and find something new to carry around. The mats we are stuck on, the issues we are trapped by in our lives, become the very things God wants to use for us to have impact in the world. Only if we can own our stories, our issues, our mats, we can truly walk and experience the healed state for us and those around us. Brennan Manning in his book, Abba's Child, says this, Christians who remain in hiding continue to live the lie. In a futile attempt to erase our past, we deprive the community of our healing gift. 
If we conceal our wounds out of fear and shame, our inner darkness can neither be illuminated nor become a light for others. If we take our stories of healing and share them with others, our gift of being healed can become a gift of hope for others. Jesus still asks this question, do you want to get well? And he deserves an honest answer. Frankly, you want to answer this question honestly. If you really want to be made well, you need to cooperate with God's power. Jesus said to the man, get up. This is still a valid invitation to you and to me. So let me ask you, what is your mat? What will it take for you to get up and pick up your mat and walk? One foot in front of the other. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much for your life on earth, for all the stories that we can read about. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your questions because you pursue us with your questions to transform our lives, to set us free, to heal us so that we can become the best versions of ourselves. Thank you, Jesus, for your healing power. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of the Sunday.
Hey everyone, we hope you enjoyed our video today. Before you go, would you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and even turn on the bell for notifications when we post videos like this and other content as well. Did you do it? Great. Now go check out Mosaic Kids.